Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. Listen again for God's word. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O God, as we continue to wait for your son's coming again, we turn to the story of his first coming. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who's heard this before? Or does it sound a little familiar? Marley was dead to begin with. Or what about this? God bless us, everyone. Maybe some more bells are ringing, or I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. For some of you who were laughing just slightly, I think you recognized those. Those are some of the more famous lines from Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Christmas Carol. I got to see a musical version of the famous tale last week and was moved once again by the about face of the old miser Ebenezer Scrooge from greed and gloom to generosity and joy. The spirits of Christmas past, present, and future worked their magic once again on Scrooge and also on me. There is something powerful about revisiting old familiar stories, particularly when they are tied up with other memories and hopes like those we hear at Christmas. This morning, as we sit at the border of the Advent season of waiting and the Christmas season of fulfillment, we hear another well-known and well-loved story. Perhaps some of these lines stick in your mind like Dickens's, greetings, or hail, favored one, the Lord is with you, or you will conceive and bear a son and you will call him Jesus, or even here am I, the servant of the Lord. This familiarity was also experienced by Luke's community, and it sounds familiar for a reason. Because in these first two chapters of his gospel, Luke draws on themes and language that his religious community would have known from the Septuagint, from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Earlier in the chapter, they heard about an elderly couple, well past childbearing years and previously barren, receiving a divine word that they would have a baby boy who would be a prophet. And so the community's imaginations would have turned to Abraham and Sarah, whose promise of descendants hung on Isaac, or to Hannah, who was unable to have children until she bore the prophet Samuel. The very foundations of the people of Israel 
depended on miraculous births. And here is another miraculous and seemingly impossible birth, this time a young woman who is yet to be married. The Hebrew scriptures are also full of examples of God speaking to unsuspecting and unsuspected people. So this angelic visitation would have also struck a chord. Just as hearing the words from a story like A Christmas Carol or scriptures like this one send our minds back to the past, so too this passage would have sent the minds of Luke's first century audience back to the faith they already claimed. Scholar Sharon Ring wrote that whatever twists and turns Luke's story may eventually take, it is from the outset recognizable as an account that connects the hearers to the God they have already come to know, to count on, and to trust. It's connected. We too are invited to let this known and loved story turn us back to the God that we have come to know. The gospel tells us of a new thing God is doing, but it is not separate from the very same God who has always been with God's covenant people. And this old story is also full of newness. Mary is a brand new character, and from the information given, there wouldn't have been much reason to take notice of her. She is not from a wealthy family or living in an important cultural center. Nazareth was just a tiny backwater village in Galilee. She is young and unmarried. There is nothing to make her stand out in a crowd. She is simply living the life of a young Palestinian girl with what was possibly, or likely, an arranged marriage waiting in the wings. Unlike Sarah and Hannah and others, Mary wasn't in need of or in want of a baby. In fact, quite the opposite. Being found pregnant before the marriage was finalized would be disastrous for her. Nevertheless, God shows up through the angel Gabriel. While Mary was going about her day, minding her own business, suddenly Gabriel appeared out of nowhere saying, Greetings, favored one. And this is a different greeting than Gabriel has given elsewhere because Gabriel appeared earlier in Luke and also in the book of Daniel. This is not the typical greeting and it, uh, or a typical opening address to a divine visitation. Hail, you who are highly favored. And Mary's reaction wasn't entirely predictable either. She is not said to immediately be terrified, but to be completely perplexed and unsettled. Her first unspoken question to Gabriel is not, who are you or what do you want? But rather, what do you mean? Mary immediately begins thinking, thinking over what this greeting could mean, thinking about why it was addressed to her. Gabriel had barely gotten a word out and Mary already found something to deeply consider. And that's part of why I love Mary. She seems to be very thoughtful. Minister and Professor Lynn Japinga says that Mary is puzzled by the words, how can she be favored? She is nothing special. Why will she be acknowledged? And this puzzlement is more than just questions. It means that she was reasoning and debating within herself. This seems completely impossible and wrong. Why would God come to her? And how was she favored as a woman without wealth or standing? When Gabriel appeared to Zechariah just a few verses before, the priest had been in the temple making an offering to God. That makes a lot more sense. But here, God was showing up in the least expected place to the least expected person. Gabriel knows Mary's confusion and answers it with assurances that she doesn't need to be afraid. Notice he doesn't say that she's wrong to be completely confused or startled, but that God is with her, so she does not need to fear. And he then delivers even more astounding news. Not only is she highly favored by God, which is big enough, but she will have a son in extraordinary circumstances and will therefore play a key role in the new thing that God is doing to bring salvation to God's people. 
This teenage girl from the middle of nowhere is now going to be the mother of a king. The long-awaited king from David's house, the one who will be called the son of the Most High. It's, it's like finding out that she was going to bear the next emperor, except even bigger, because this would be the true God, the God of Israel. This would have implications on the whole world. This king would have ultimate authority, a never-ending reign that would somehow knock even the empire of Rome off its throne. Talk about perplexing news and a truly valid reason to be terrified. How can this be? Mary asks. It all seems impossible. But Gabriel doesn't offer a divine roadmap or step-by-step instructions. I mean, even Scrooge got a little more detail when he got precise arrival times for the three spirits that would visit. But instead of a crystal clear plan, Gabriel just assures Mary that she is not alone. He gives her the promise of presence, both divine and human. The Holy Spirit would come upon her and overshadow her. These same words are used again at the transfiguration when Jesus' divine nature is revealed to his disciples and they are overshadowed by God's glory. As the presence of the Lord overshadowed the people of Israel while they journeyed from Egypt, so God's presence would be with Mary in the closest, most intimate way possible. The Lord was with her then and would continue to be with her. And Gabriel also assured her that she would have company in the form of her relative Elizabeth. In telling Mary about Elizabeth's miraculous conception, She was being given a co-journeyer, someone who could understand what it was to be approached by God in a special way and to have one's life turned upside down for a holy purpose. And it was after these assurances that Mary found the courage to say, here am I, let it be with me according to your word. Raj Nadella identifies this as the good news in this passage. That presence is the story of incarnation in this reading. Not simple assurances that God cares for us, but the fact that God will share in the human experience and journey with us in our everyday lived contexts. Mary was not overlooked and she would not be alone as she lived into this new call that God had placed on her. Gabriel tells her that she was known and loved and would continue to be accompanied by that holy love. This story is ultimately one of transformation as so many of our well-known and well-loved Christmas stories are, like that of Ebenezer Scrooge. Yes, I won't be letting this go. What makes A Christmas Carol remarkable and what has given it such staying power isn't merely the fantastic premise of ghosts visiting a miserly old man, although a little bit of spookiness at Christmas is always a good thing. Rather, it is the change that those spirits led him to make that makes the story so remarkable. In the course of one night, those spirits led Scrooge to look back at what had been finding previously overlooked moments of love and missed opportunities for love. And then he saw the present circumstances of those around him that he otherwise would not have looked for. And he was given a glimpse of a future which held no promise for him and more devastatingly saw a world no better for his having been in it. And in that one brief night of encounter, he was completely changed into one who sought to bring life and light into the world out of his own gratitude. It was a miraculous transformation. And while perhaps not as theatrical, the change in Mary is no less meaningful. Nadella puts it this way, In the end, Mary's story stands out for the impressive transformation from her initial response of being afraid and greatly troubled to a question about how this might be possible to a final affirmation of the announcement. 
Mary is transformed from just a young girl on the brink of marriage to the bearer of God incarnate. She is changed from one who had a voice that no one would heed to one who was free to sing aloud of God's justice and favor for the powerless. Because of Gabriel's announcement, Mary saw that she was known and loved by God. And this knowledge set her free to freely and joyfully say yes to the invitation to participate in God's work in the world, as Lynn Japinga writes. And because of this transformation in Mary, Jesus has come. God with us has taken on flesh. We have been shown that God is powerfully with us and among us and at work. As we hear this old story again this year, we can let our imaginations go to the past, present, and future. We can catch a glimpse of the future God is writing, learn from the places of love and the missed opportunities of the past, and look clear-eyed at the world as it is. There's a beautiful image making its way across social media of a piece of art by Kelly Lattimore. And it shows Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus huddled together. But instead of being inside a starlit stable, they are in the midst of a pile of rubble in the middle of a town on fire and crumbling. When we see things as they are, we will see the fires and the destroyed homes and the crumbling spirits that are too present because of war, hatred, and injustice. But that's also when we see the incarnation for the miracle that it is. We can see that we are known and loved so much that God still enters into the rubble of our world in order to do a new thing. We can hear the invitation to join God in that work. Knowing our belovedness and hearing that invitation means that we are able to do the true work of Christmas, which Howard Thurman described. We are able to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. That's the work of Christmas. So let us hear the well-known and well-loved story, beloved ones. And then, like Mary, let us join in God's redeeming work in the world. Amen.